In this chapter, I'm going to review some aspects of general histology that will be relevant to dental histology and embryology. We will cover the four basic tissue types that you should have learned about in your anatomy and physiology class. We don't need to cover all of the different types of tissues found in the human body. Instead, I would like you to focus on a few key concepts. Ultimately, we're going to learn about tooth development being an interaction between an epithelium and an underlying connective tissue, which is called a mesenchyme. In this chapter, we're going to focus on adult tissues. But when you look at regions of the skin and oral mucosa, please notice that there is the same pattern. An outer layer of epidermis, which is epithelial, and underneath that is a layer of connective tissues. One of the other connective tissues we would like to focus on is bone tissue. We're going to be interested in the maxilla and mandible, but we're also going to be interested in the extracellular matrix of bone tissue because it is very similar to enamel, dentin, and cementum. And lastly, we can pay attention to the periodontal ligaments which are similar to any other ligaments in the body, being composed of dense regular connective tissue. In the previous chapter, we reviewed some basic concepts of cell biology, and we're now ready to jump ahead and talk about tissues, which are a group of cells of the same type working together. Tissues are either made up entirely of cells, or they're made by cells. Later, we'll look at organs, which have two or more tissues inside of them. The four main tissue types are epithelial, connective, muscle, and nervous tissue. These are probably the four classes of tissue that you learned about in your anatomy prerequisite. This list comes from histologists who were looking at adult tissues. We we'll later be looking at embryonic tissues. And you might notice that this list is not quite perfect. For instance, if we were to classify these six cells based on their hair color and tooth shape and nose shape, we might group them into two major groupings. But what if we had picked eye color or something else? But what if instead of looking at physical characteristics in adulthood, you looked at family trees? If I said the six cells in the bottom row came from these following lineages, you might classify them differently than we did on the previous page, instead lumping them into two separate groups, one of which having two subgroups within it. Based off this family history, we might say that hair color really isn't that important when it comes to determining who is related to whom. Embryologists classify tissues differently than those four main types that I listed two pages ago. An embryologist is someone who studies the lineage of cells, and based on that family history, Embryologists can classify tissues as either being ectoderm, mesoderm, or endoderm, which literally means the outer layer, the middle layer, and the inner layer. The outer layer of cells will turn into an epithelia or nervous tissue. The middle layer of cells turns into our connective and muscle tissues for the most part, and the inner layer of cells turns into different types of epithelia. For instance, some of the tissues we're going to learn about in this course include enamel, dentin, and cementum, which are all derived from this outer ectodermal layer. Pulp, the lamina propria, bone tissue and the periodontal ligaments, as well as muscles in the oral cavity, are all derived from mesoderm. Salivary glands in the eustachian tube are all derived from endoderm. To an embryologist, it makes the most sense to classify tissues based off of their lineage or their family history. Instead, we're going to ignore that for a while. We'll come back to it. 
but for the rest of this lecture we'll be focusing on the four main tissue types which are named based off of what histologists saw under the microscope from human organs. And let's start with epithelia, one of those four major tissue types. Epithelia are always at the surface of the body, lining our outer or our inner surfaces. They are mostly cells and have very little extracellular matrix. They can be involved in protection, forming fairly thick barriers, or they can be involved in absorption and secretion, in which case the epithelium would be a lot thinner. All epithelia are derived from stem cells. These are the cells within the tissue that are capable of undergoing mitosis to produce two genetically identical daughter cells. One of these daughter cells will remain a stem cell, but the second one can differentiate, meaning it'll start behaving and looking differently. Usually, this means that the differentiated cell will stop its ability to undergo mitosis. And if we need more of those cells, the stem cell must undergo mitosis once again to produce two new daughter cells, one of which could stay the stem cell, the other of which could differentiate into the cell that's needed in the tissue. In a stratified epithelium, those stem cells are located in the deepest portions. And as the cells differentiate and get older, they get pushed outwards. Because an epithelium is mostly cells, and cells are kind of squishy, desmosomes, or anchoring junctions, help to hold those cells together and use their cytoskeletons in a group. Hemidesmosomes can anchor those cells down to underlying connective tissue, a thin layer of which often gets called the basement membrane, although this is very hard to spot using just light microscopy. For thicker epithelia, cells are anchored to other cells on their apical and basal sides by another set of anchoring junctions. Epithelia are avascular. That means they don't have any direct contact with the blood. Instead, nutrients must come from the underlying connective tissues, which is where the blood vessels are located. And nutrients must diffuse out of the blood into the epithelium. For a stratified epithelium, this means that the outer layers are far away from the bloodstream. And because diffusion does not occur quickly, the outer layers of a stratified epithelium tend to be dead. We classify epithelia based off of how many layers they have and the shape of their cells. A simple epithelium would have just one layer of cells whereas a stratified epithelium would have cells on top of other cells. We must also consider the cell shape. Squamous epithelia are flat. Cuboidal epithelia tend to be roughly as tall as they are wide. And columnar epithelia are definitely taller than they are wide. There's also a couple exceptions to this rule. Pseudostratified and transitional epithelia don't have any of the previous words in them. Otherwise, all epithelia would have one of these two words plus one of these three words. A simple cuboidal epithelium, such as the one that we see here, involves a single layer of cells that are roughly as wide as they are tall. They often form ducts we will see some of these in the salivary glands. Underneath every single layer of cuboidal epithelial cells will be some connective tissue. So when you're looking at this image over here, see if you can spot the nucleuses that you think belong to simple cuboidal epithelial cells versus the nucleuses that probably belong to some of the connective tissue cells underneath. <laughs> 
I'll highlight the simple cuboidal epithelia here in pink. You'll notice there are multiple layers, some of which get close to each other. But just because we've got two simple epithelia close to each other does not make them stratified. Underneath these epithelial cells are the connective tissue cells, including a bunch of extracellular matrix. A simple columnar epithelium has a single layer of tall epithelial cells. We'll see one of these in the inner enamel epithelium when we start learning about tooth formation. In this image to the right, I'll highlight the simple columnar epithelial cells, which contain a bunch of those blobby blue goblet cells scattered throughout. And then underneath that, we find the connective tissue. A pseudostratified epithelium can be found in the sinuses and parts of the nasal cavity. A pseudostratified epithelium contains a number of goblet cells which secrete mucus, and then the cilia on the epithelial cells can remove that mucus from the respiratory tract. Here in this image, I'll highlight the pseudostratified epithelial cells along with their cilia, and then the goblet cells which produce the mucus, which can trap pathogens and debris, which gets removed by the cilia. Underneath this epithelium would be a bunch of connective tissue. Highlighted in the little box down here to the right, you might notice a simple squamous epithelium making up a capillary. We won't be paying too much attention to the simple squamous epithelia, although they do exist. Stratified squamous epithelia can be found in the skin and the oral mucosa. And even though they're given different names, they have very similar characteristics. Later, we'll learn that's because they share the same lineage. But these types of epithelia have multiple layers of cells, the outermost of which tend to be dead and flat. And that's where we arbitrarily picked their name squamous. The deeper cells close to the basal side are more cuboidal. Next, let's review some of the connective tissues that we'll be covering in this course. They are derived from mesoderm that comes from somites in early development. The mesoderm will turn into a number of different connective tissues, which have a number of different jobs that I have listed over here. Their name would suggest that they simply connect one thing to another, but in reality, their functions are quite diverse. One thing that connective tissues have in common is that because they come from mesoderm, they have in their family lineage some mesenchymal stem cells. Many connective tissues continue to have mesenchymal stem cells in the tissue that are required for the repair of that tissue when it gets damaged. Mesenchyme is a type of connective tissue that you may not have learned about previous to this course. And that is because it only exists in embryos. By the time we reach childhood, this tissue has differentiated into some other type of tissue. But if you go way back and look at embryonic tissues, you can find some mesenchyme, which is composed primarily of mesenchymal stem cells. These are undifferentiated stem cells that are capable of undergoing mitosis and later differentiating into a wide array of different types of connective tissue cells. They will do so in response to some sort of a signal known as a morphogen. Mesenchyme is first formed in a process called gastrulation. Initially, an embryo only has epithelial cells. So to form this new type of tissue, some of those epithelial cells must transition into mesenchymal cells. And we're going to call that an epithelial to mesenchymal transition, 
And that phrase is in bold for a reason. Ectomesenchyme is a special type of mesenchyme that we will see. And instead of being derived from your average everyday epithelial cell, it comes from a specialized type of neural tissue called neural crest cells. These migrate away from the central nervous system into other parts of the body, like the jaws, and differentiate into a special type of mesenchyme that turns into interesting parts of the teeth. Connective tissues usually have just a few cells. Those cells are mostly fibroblasts and mesenchymal stem cells, if this is a generic connective tissue. Mesenchymal stem cells, like the stem cells in an epithelium, are capable of undergoing mitosis, producing another stem cell and a cell that could differentiate in the cell type that's needed. For the connective tissues that are mostly made of fibers, the cell type that would be needed is a fibroblast. While the cells of a connective tissue are very important, the bulk of most of the connective tissues is actually composed of extracellular matrix, or all of the stuff found outside of the cell. From the previous chapter, you may recall that might be proteins or carbohydrates like the hyaluronic acid. I've highlighted here the cells in this type of connective tissue. Some of these cells are fibroblasts, probably the ones that look all spiky, and others might be the stem cells, possibly the ones that look fairly indifferent or undifferentiated. It's hard to tell just by looking at them, but that's a pretty good guess. And then everything outside of those cells would be the extracellular matrix. Extracellular matrix can include fibers, which are very large proteins, and then ground substance, which is the gelatinous material that we discussed in the previous chapter. In this image, I've now drawn in some elastic fibers. This type of protein is very springy or elastic, hence its name. Collagen fibers are much larger and stronger. And a third type of fiber that can be found in a connective tissue is fibronectin, which is difficult to see under the microscope without using fairly specialized stains, not like the pink and purple stain that we're using here. Then, in addition to these fibers that have been made by the fibroblasts, there's the ground substance, or the diffuse gelatinous material, that helps to hold everything in place. Depending on which textbook you read, you may see a slightly different list than this, but the three major fiber types found in the extracellular matrix that I would like to focus on are the ones that I think are most important to embryology, include collagen fibers, which are the biggest and the strongest fibers. These are proteins made by the fibroblasts. Scar tissue is pretty much nothing but collagen fibers. Elastic fibers are made in connective tissues that need elasticity, such as parts of the oral cavity involved in swallowing and speech. These can undergo deformation, such as during swallowing, and then snap back to their original shape. The third type of fiber that's very important to us is fibronectin. Even though it's hard to see in the older histology slides, it's a very important molecule used in scaffolding during the formation of tissues. We will see these scaffolds are also very important in tissue repair, so we're going to pay a lot of attention to the fibronectin, which plays two major roles. One, it acts as a foothold along which cells can migrate, and two, it provides those cells with information as to where they are located. There have been a number of advances in the use of tissue scaffolds, including using 3D printers to custom print 
tissue transplants in a number of different medical applications. If you'd like to learn a little bit more, I made a little journal club video here. You can click on this link and follow it. For instance, tissue scaffolds help mesenchymal stem cells to migrate into a region that's been damaged. There they can divide by mitosis and then differentiate into the cell types that are needed. This differentiation can be guided by proteins like fibronectin. One example that we'll see this term is the use of pericardial patches in gingival recession. But you might also be interested to know that fibrin, which can form blood clots, can be used as a glue in surgeries. And we don't even need to use actual proteins. There are other molecules that can form polymers that can replace those proteins. Okay, we can now start discussing the actual connective tissues, beginning with areolar connective tissue. You may recognize this image. It's the same one I used to teach you about the basic components of all connective tissues. And areolar connective tissue contains a little bit of everything. Shown right now, are the cells, which include fibroblasts, which are probably these spiky looking cells, as well as some mesenchymal stem cells, which could be these round, undifferentiated. There we are, got some elastic fibers, which are skinny and springy, the much thicker collagen fibers, which are strong, and what we can't really see under the microscope is fibronectin but functionally, it's a very important fiber out in the extracellular matrix. The rest of the space is filled up with ground substance, including hyaluronic acid, which can attract water, forming a gel-like substance. This provides space and structure for cells to migrate through and even create other structures like capillaries. Next up is dense irregular connective tissue, which includes cells and collagen fibers. And that's what it mostly has. Here's the H&E stain. I'll highlight the cells, which are mostly fibroblasts and mesenchymal stem cells. And then the rest of that pink stuff are collagen fibers going in various directions. There is a little bit of ground substance as well, although it's mostly collagen fibers. And in the case of dense irregular connective tissue, those fibers are pointed more or less at random. We will find a lot of dense irregular connective tissue underneath the epithelial layers found in the skin and the oral mucosa. Dense regular connective tissue, on the other hand, there's our picture of it, is very similar to dense irregular connective tissue, except that the collagen fibers are all pointing roughly in the same direction. But the big purple circles you see are the nucleuses that belong to either fibroblasts or mesenchymal stem cells. Next is adipose tissue, another type of connective tissue. Adipose tissue is highly vascular, and it is composed mostly of adipocytes, the major cell type, rather than extracellular matrix, which makes it a little bit different from most of the other connective tissues. I'll highlight the adipocytes here, but there are also some mesenchymal stem cells found within here. Adipocytes are mostly filled with triglycerides found within inclusions. Highlighted here are the mesenchymal stem cells. These cells can divide and differentiate into new adipocytes if more adipose tissue is needed. Next up is cartilage. Most of the cartilage we're going to be looking at is a type called hyaline cartilage. But there's also fibrocartilage and elastic cartilage in a few places that you might be interested in. Let's start with hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage is created by cells called chondroblasts. 
These come from mesenchymal stem cells and begin secreting the extracellular matrix that makes up cartilage, which is mostly ground substance. Those cells are found within tiny little pockets in the mature tissue called lacunae. I'll highlight those lacunae here. It's within those spaces that you'll find the cells, the chondrocytes, and they are the ones that secreted all of the purplish ground substance. Now there is some collagen found within the extracellular matrix as well, but it's mostly ground substance, proteins and carbohydrates such as hyaluronic acid, which attracts water, making this a springy gelatinous type of tissue. But as you get to the outer borders of cartilage tissue, you find more collagen fibers, and this can be called the perichondrium. It represents something more similar to a dense, regular connective tissue because of its higher collagen content. And then often outside of collagen, outside of the cartilage, you'll find some type of connective tissue like dense, irregular connective tissue. So what, what I would like to point out here is there's no absolute dividing line between the cartilage, the perichondrium, and then the dense irregular connective tissue that's a different tissue type. And in fact, these different types of connective tissues all kind of blend together. And that's because they all come from the same family member. They are all ultimately made by mesenchymal stem cells. The vast amount of ground substance found within cartilage gives it flexibility. But cartilage is different from many other connective tissues in that it is avascular. It does not have its own blood supply. Therefore, when cartilage gets damaged, it's very slow to regenerate, if it's capable of regeneration at all. Next, we need to review some of the components of bone which is a type of connective tissue that makes up the majority of the adult human skeleton. We will be very interested in the bones that surround the teeth. The type of bone tissue found there is a special type of bone tissue called alveolar bone. Most bones are surrounded by a periosteum, which, like the perichondrium, is a dense-ish, regular-ish connective tissue that's mostly collagen fibers. Most bones are composed of compact bone on the outside and spongy bone on the inside. When I say most, I mean pretty much all of them except for the maxilla and mandible, which have those specialized regions of alveolar bone. Bone tissue, being a connective tissue, is mostly extracellular matrix, in this case, the components of the extracellular matrix include an organic component, which is collagen. That's pretty standard for a connective tissue, but also an inorganic component, which is calcium phosphate crystals. This gives bone tissue its hardness. The collagen, on the other hand, acts like rebar which gives bone tissue the ability to bend and resist stress rather than fracturing. Bone is made by cells that ultimately come from mesenchymal stem cells. These stem cells can divide by mitosis, producing two clones, one of which will stay a stem cell, and the other, if given the right morphogen, can differentiate into an osteoblast. Osteoblasts are the cells that blast out all of the extracellular matrix making bone tissue. But when they're done making all of that extracellular matrix, those osteoblasts will in turn differentiate into the mature osteocytes, which are what are found in mature bone tissue. There are regions where you can find some osteoblasts that are useful in repair of bone tissue following damage, as well as mesenchymal stem cells.
Those are typically found on the inner and outer layers of the bone tissue, the periosteum and the endosteum. So just to repeat, the osteoblasts in turn come from those mesenchymal stem cells. But there's a fourth cell type that's very important found within bone tissue. And that is the osteoclast. These cells do not come from mesenchymal stem cells, but instead come from deeper within the bone marrow from cells more related to white blood cells. These osteoclasts are capable of dissolving bone tissue and releasing calcium into the bloodstream. The two major types of bone tissue are compact and spongy. Compact bone is created one layer at a time, creating circumferential layers that all together we call an osteon. Spongy bone, on the other hand, forms trabeculae, tiny spicules that are made more in a spiral shape. But both types of bone tissue are made by osteoblasts, which then differentiate into osteocytes found within these two different types of structures. Here's compact bone under the microscope. We are looking at a number of osteons with the haversion or central canals in the center. The osteocytes are these dark spider-like shapes found within the extracellular matrix. Like the chondrocytes, they too live within lacunae or tiny little spaces within the extracellular matrix. And they are connected to one another by tiny little extensions called canaliculi. But these cells are found within, or I should say between the layers of the extracellular matrix, that collagen and calcium phosphate crystals. Spongy bone would be found deep to compact bone, except in regions where the bones connect to teeth or the alveoli. It's here that we have a special type of bone tissue that has more holes in it. And these holes are for ligaments and blood vessels that connect to the teeth. These regions can be called the cribriform plate, but just be aware, there's also a cribriform plate in the ethmoid bone. Next, let's review how bone tissue forms. Bones can form one of two ways either by endochondral ossification or intramembranous ossification. The two processes are very similar. The major difference is what we start with. Endochondral ossification begins with a cartilage model, and most of the bones from the neck down develop in this fashion. Most of the skull develops by intramembranous ossification, except for parts of the mandible. So from the neck down, we usually start with a cartilage model. At some point, the chondrocytes begin to change and they stop releasing the anti-angiogenic factors that block blood vessels from growing into this tissue. And when that happens, blood vessels are able to start growing towards this tissue. Mesenchymal stem cells can migrate through the blood to get here differentiate into osteoblasts, and begin laying down a bony collar. But eventually blood vessels will grow into the cartilage, allowing mesenchymal stem cells to arrive deep within this cartilage model, develop and differentiate into osteoblasts, and begin laying down bone tissue from the inside. And we call this the primary ossification center. Initially, we're producing spongy bone. This spongy bone will continue to grow in size, but eventually it will be remodeled. For instance, we will remove some of the spongy bone, making the medullary cavity of the long bones. Next, blood vessels will grow into the epiphyses 
and new regions of ossification will begin. We call these the secondary ossification sites. These two will begin to expand until we've nearly replaced all of the cartilage with bone tissue. We do leave cartilage in a couple of places at the ends or the articular surfaces, as well as the epiphyseal plates, which is where these bones will grow from. And once we've laid down a whole bunch of spongy bone, we will begin remodeling this spongy bone as well, replacing the outer portions with compact bone and possibly removing some of the deeper portions, making the bones hollow. Next, I need to review bone repair. One thing we're going to learn this term is that wound healing, such as healing a broken bone, recapitulates development. And what that means is we go through the processes of growing new tissue the same way that we did when we were growing that tissue in the first place during embryonic development. And so bone fracture repair is going to be very similar to endochondral ossification, or how bone tissue grew in the first place, back when we were embryos. But if an adult bone gets injured, it will bleed, producing a blood clot, and an internal blood clot would be called a hematoma. All of the fibers in that blood clot would provide a scaffold for blood vessels to grow into this tissue. Next, we will convert that blood clot into what's called a soft callus. This is made of fibrocartilage. Fibrocartilage is very similar to the hyaline cartilage that I showed you, except that it has more collagen fibers. That makes it somewhat analogous to scar tissue, which is what's produced initially after injury to the skin. Now, we make this soft callus because bone tissue can't grow in a vacuum. It needs a scaffold, and that scaffold has to be a type of cartilage. So now that we have a scaffold and new blood vessels, mesenchymal stem cells can migrate into this area and begin replacing that cartilage with bone tissue, producing what is called a hard callus. After that, the hard callus is remodeled so that it has compact bone on the edges, followed by spongy bone, and possibly even deeper hollow regions. In my little cartoon here, I showed you that this hard callus is now a little bit larger than the bone tissue that we had there before. So just like injury to the skin, when we repair bones, we repair them so that they're a little bit stronger than they were before, so that we don't get another fracture at the exact same place. All right, there's the remodeling. And lastly, we have to remove those extra blood vessels by apoptosis. And now we have finished. We've got new bone tissue. Now, in cases where there's a lot of bone tissue missing, it might be difficult for the body to produce that soft callus. And in those cases, Surgeons might use some form of scaffolding to try and give bone cells the grip that they need to replace bone tissue. A scaffold can be made of collagen or it can be made of other polymers that mimic the density of fibrocartilage. And when you add such a scaffolding to the missing area, that allows the patient's own mesenchymal stem cells to migrate into the area, differentiate into osteoblasts, and replace that missing tissue with bone tissue. We might even give those mesenchymal stem cells some morphogens, the signals that tell them to differentiate into an osteoblast, as opposed to differentiating into fibroblasts or chondroblasts which are 
also things that mesenchymal stem cells can differentiate into. So, the two major things that we need when trying to promote wound healing in bone tissue is some extracellular matrix that mimics the density of fibrocartilage. And then we might also want to have some morphogens that tell these mesenchymal stem cells to differentiate into osteoblasts as opposed to fibroblasts or adipocytes. And if we have those two things, the scaffold and the morphogen, large amounts of bone tissue can be replaced more quickly than just allowing the body to go through its own healing process on its own. And this is something that's often necessary to do when there's been a lot of bone loss. And as we'll see later this term, a lot of bone loss can occur following tooth loss. Next, I need to review the process of bone remodeling. Just because we made a bone doesn't mean that it's done growing. And as bones go through their lifespan, they will go through this constant cycle of removing bone tissue and replacing bone tissue. And as long as the osteoclasts are removing bone tissue at the same rate that the osteoblasts are replacing it, we should maintain healthy bones. Now, this may seem a little bit strange to destroy bone tissue only to replace it. But remember, that's what our skin is doing all of the time as well. We're sloughing off skin cells and making new ones. So this just makes sure that damage to our bones doesn't build up because we're constantly replacing some of the older parts with newer parts. Sometimes the osteoclasts work a little bit harder than the osteoblasts. And in that case, you might get localized resorption of bone tissue. Infections, mechanical stresses, and some other things can cause osteoblasts to slow down. Generalized resorption may occur across the entire body. This often follows changes to the endocrine system, such as the loss of estrogen during menopause. Or it could happen with nutritional deficiencies, such as low blood calcium or low phosphate levels. Osteoporosis is a disease of generalized bone resorption. It typically affects spongy bone more than compact bone because spongy bone is more metabolically active. Therefore, bones that have relatively more spongy bone will be affected by osteoporosis more than others. One example is the mandible. It has relatively a lot of spongy bone and therefore osteoporosis affects the mandibles more than other bones like your radius or ulna. As the mandible weakens, this can cause a loss of teeth. And because estrogen promotes bone growth, the loss of estrogen at menopause increases the risk of osteoporosis for women more than men which isn't to say that men don't get osteoporosis. They do. It's just significantly more women suffer from osteoporosis and suffer more than men. Okay, well, that's about gonna wrap us up for general histology. I'll be reviewing many of these points as we talk about these tissues found within the oral cavity. But let's finish with a case study. We have a 35-year-old woman and on her appointment, we see some gingival recession and bleeding on probing and some calculus in various areas. And later, we're going to measure some pocket depths. So based off of what we've learned in this lecture, there's not a lot of clinical stuff that we can cover. But I could ask you where the bleeding on probing comes from, which of these types of tissues. Now, if you don't know where the sulcular, junctional, and pocket epithelium are strictly located, 
and which ones of those could be related to bleeding on probing, I've got a little easy trick for you. In this chapter, we learned that epithelia are avascular. So the blood that we're seeing is not coming from the epithelial tissues. We might have damaged one of these tissues, but the blood is coming from underneath in the connective tissue. It is the connective tissues, with the exception of cartilage, that are vascular. So that wraps up this chapter. Next, we'll go into the tissues of the oral cavity.